This is a story about how creativity in its purest form can deliver amazing business results. I think what this paper does is it shows that those imaginative leaps that we all kind of fear to a degree actually do remarkable things because they create fame and fame uh, typically drives awareness and goodwill and effectiveness. Cadbury Dairy Milk is, a, is an institution in the UK, so it's a brand that's bought by 90% of UK households. It's something that people consume from cradle to grave and has uh, you know, a real place in people's hearts. So in 2007, Cadbury Dairy Milk was essentially treading water. Signs of age were just starting to creep in, so sales were starting to flatline, having previously been in growth. Cadbury had realised that Cadbury Dairy Milk had effectively lost a generation of consumers, so some people preferred Galaxy, the, a younger generation. We'd also suffered a big uh, product recall due to the Salmonella incident that happened in 2006. Then there were some slightly worrying signs in a kind of retail space where there was an over-reliance on promotion and a big pressure on price. So it really was a brand and a business that needed a jolt to get momentum back in to get the business results moving forward. There was quite a traditional approach to marketing, it's fair to say. If you look at chocolate advertising in this country and actually around the world, there tends to be quite a formula like the swirly chocolate shop, the, the breaking of the bar, showing people consuming the product in, in certain situations, which is all relevant and true, but it just made a lot of the advertising campaigns seem very similar. The weaknesses of that model, even though it was good at familiarity, was that it wasn't very good at building fame because it was predicated on an ongoing comforting, familiar conversation. And the view of the new marketing team at Cadbury when they came in was, I think, that it was time to challenge that model and to see whether there was something more powerful they could do to leverage the brand. The two key pillars of the new model were fame and love. So fame, critically important for an impulse market where if someone's walking past the chocolate aisle, you want Cadbury to jump into their head more than anything else. And Love, this is a brand that was one of the nation's favourite brands, but had just become a little bit forgotten and a little bit taken for granted. We were given two weeks to pitch, which of course I always tell people is too short, but actually does lend urgency and excitement to the process. Frankly, the brief was fantastic because it didn't labour the point. It just said this brand should be loved and isn't. Its communications should feel like um, a simple moment of joy, just like the bar itself. And I remember um, Juan Cabral, who wrote and directed Gorilla, stopped them at that point and said, don't say anything else. If your brief is to make some content that is a little moment of joy in people's lives, like your chocolate bar is, I can do that. And the idea was to behave like a production company, so uh, glass and a half full productions was the thought, and that was really about Cadbury going from being makers of chocolate to being purveyors of joy, so acting like a Disney, like a Pixar, and making bits of content that just put a smile on your face. And obviously the first example of that uh, was Gorilla, and, and the way that worked, I remember them talking about the logic of the idea, and then somebody pressed a button on a CD player, cue the opening strains of, uh, strains of Phil Collins in the air tonight and I remember sitting there just feeling an amazing feeling thinking this is incredible and uh, turning to uh, Lee Rolston who was working with me on the brand and just looking at each other with this big smile on our face like two kids going that's amazing isn't it and, and I think really from that moment on we just had a real belief and conviction that it would have been criminal if the UK public hadn't seen that because we just thought it, it would be an amazing an amazing film and, and achieve the objective of making people smile. So once we had, as the, the brand team bought the idea, we then had the uh, probably unenviable task of convincing other people in the organisation that it was the right thing to do. And if you take a step back and just think about what we were trying to sell, so it was an ad that was three times longer than a normal ad, it had no chocolate in it and it didn't really have an explicit message. Um, and so when we shared the idea with senior stakeholders, their first response was to look at us and think, sorry, you know, are you mad? And what really happened over a six-month period was we, through sheer tenacity, 
just kept going back and used lots of different things to uh, to convince people that it was the right thing to do. So drawing on a lot of um, more academic evidence around neuroscience, around things like low involvement processing. So a lot of the, the thinking about how different ways that people consumers uh, React. Research methodologies reflect the beliefs of the research companies behind them, and commercial like this challenges a lot of those orthodoxies. Gorilla went into four rounds of pre-testing, so it wasn't done on a whim. It went through two rounds of qualitative pre-testing, two rounds of quantitative pre-testing, and the question that the client asked at every term was, do people like it, and do they know it's from Cadbury? For what was really clear was just how engaging this ad was going to be to the point that Mill Brown actually said they needed to reset the scale on the, on the interest trace because it literally went off the scale. So that really confirmed that this would be incredibly engaging. Where it was more problematic was around how well branded the ad is and I think the way the questions around that are, you know, people are asked to what extent could this be an ad for any other brand and logically you'd say, well, it could be. What, but what that didn't factor in was just the sheer engagement and, and cut-through that it would have. So in, in a research environment, it, it has scored, scored a very low branding score. When it came to the reality, it actually got the highest ever branded recall of an ad, 96% of people. Um, so, so I think it, it just demonstrated that as you move um, advertising models forward you have to make sure that the research method, m models move with it and it's not a kind of pass fail it's about interpreting the results and using judgment to go with it. What we did was tease the launch of this film as if it was a big film event so we had advertising in the listings pages of the newspapers. So Friday night he's been waiting for this moment all his life Channel 4, 9.30. We had posters that looked like cinema posters and we really got the anticipation for this piece of content building before we put it on air. We then placed the ad for the first time in the live final of Big Brother, which we knew would be a, a high-rating programme. And um, so we'd set all of that up and I remember sat there on the Friday night watching the programme uh, and I had my laptop open and, and listening uh, and and watching straight away what happened and almost within minutes or hours you could see the YouTube views racking up comments that people were saying wow have you seen that amazing and by the time we got to the end of the first weekend there were uh, over a quarter of a million views on YouTube and just an incredible buzz in terms of the way people were talking about it and so it was, it was a great thing to be able to go into the office on Monday and, and say to people, it's very early days, but this is what's happening. And, and I think pretty much from that first weekend, we sensed that we had something really special on our hands. What was really exciting to us as brand advocates was that it was almost taken out of our hands and people were passing it round, spoofing it, writing about it, speculating on how it was made, who was in the suit. It became a phenomenon on its own, out of our control, which was actually the best thing that could have happened for the brand. So we'd, we'd had a bit of experience. Because we'd done the Sony Balls commercial, we'd got wise, not as wise as advertisers are now, to what early social media could do for you and, and the way in which a dramatic piece of content could get picked up online. I think Gorilla, though, was um, the moment where a mass British advertiser first enjoyed the kind of the following wind of... YouTube and sharing and all of that stuff. After four weeks, we paid for 38% of the UK population to see the ad, yet brand tracking suggested that 63% of consumers had seen it, so that difference was all earned media. That was, I suppose, the really hard proof that going after salience and impact above all else was a really efficient way of spending the budget. So it was a great example of, um, if you want something to go viral, buy against it rather than just keep your fingers crossed 
but I think also the first example of something, uh, yeah, British and mass getting picked up in that way. Juan uh, was very insistent. It was not just Phil Collins, but in the air tonight because uh, he thinks it's the finest drum drum solo in musical history. Discuss. So we never wavered uh, from that, and of course. Once Phil Collins had given permission for it to be used, he enjoyed a return to the charts, I think a very successful world tour <laughs> on the basis of his renewed um, cultural um, imprint. And uh, I think one of the pleasures, though, was other people putting Deep Purple and Bonnie Tyler and the East Enders theme tune and all of that stuff over the exact same um, action. That was one of, the, one of the pleasures of seeing how much people love music and how they could play with the commercial for kind of the, the first time in a way. We decided to take uh, one of the most popular of those which was uh, Bonnie Tyler, Total Eclipse of the Heart and we, we ran that as, as a revised Gorilla ad uh, the, the following year so it was a great example of where things that members of the public were doing then were adopted by the brand and, and shared more broadly. So about a year after Gorilla first aired, once we'd got a, a sufficient amount of data, we commissioned a, an econometric study to understand, isolate and prove the business effectiveness. And so it was great to be able to go back to people like the chief exec and say that this campaign delivered four times the normal return on investment that you would expect from a, an FMCG advertising campaign. So Cadbury Dairy Milk were facing huge hikes in commodity prices and I think the price of cocoa and sugar was the highest it had been for three decades. So there was a big threat to the business in terms of possible volume losses in the face of those price increases. What we found through Econometrics was that the effect of glass and half productions was actually to harden price elasticity so the volume lost in the face of price increase was 27% lower than it would have been without the campaign. I think we all um, uh, walked into that edit suite thinking it would be more funny and less kind of true um, and then you see this piece and realise that it actually does look like a real gorilla. <laughs> and so many people identified with him. You know, for all the efforts of advertisers to promote people and slices of family life that we're supposed to identify with, it was actually a gorilla playing the drums that made a lot of people go, oh, I know exactly I know exactly how he feels. <laughs> the irony is, I think, consumers got gorilla more quickly than a lot of people in the industry because they weren't burdened with that set of rules about how ads should work. So post gorilla there was that difficult second album challenge of how do you follow up something like that and I think it's fair to say that trucks was more polarizing and didn't achieve the immense cultural impact that gorilla did. What it did do though because we had the time with trucks to take it through the line and really execute it in store and in all the touch points we wanted to. Trucks, in the end, had a bigger business effect even than Gorilla did. And then we went from trucks to the eyebrows ad, which uh, again just really captured the public's imagination. I think at last count, there's something like 16 million views on, on YouTube, countless spoofs, so whether it's Anton Deck or uh, Alan Carr and Lily Allen, uh, again, really cut through into popular culture, and I think we had the, uh, the pleasure of seeing both the Gorilla and Eyebrows ad spoofed in one sketch in a primetime comedy programme, which, you know, is just amazing. This is a big brand that enjoys old-fashioned spend um, that enjoys uh, the support of big grocery brands when it spends. So there was always a dance between doing the, um, 
the orthodox broadcast piece well and then dialing in social media and eyebrows was probably the sweet spot of that just because it was so easy to engage and actually shoot yourself so to speak um, rather than just enjoying a piece of content and passing it on. So the idea behind the fair trade communication was rather than create just a message to create a track and a song that captured the essence of fair trade and why Cadbury was going to be the biggest chocolate manufacturer to go fair trade. And for us that was a really important step in Glass and Half Productions because Glass and Half Productions is about content, not just TV, not just film, not just print, but content of all types. So for us creating a track and a video was a really important step in the development of the campaign. People always wonder what the bridge between creativity and effectiveness is. Often it's fame. Creativity brings originality to bear, which sometimes, not always, translates into creative fame or brand fame, and that often sits behind effectiveness, just because people don't think especially hard about what they buy. We're all too busy, quite rightly, so we buy emotionally, and it's no surprise, therefore, that the more famous brands do better, and that the more emotional communication, certainly on TV, outperforms the stuff that's persuading you to buy this rather than that. So here you have an ad that doesn't show any product, that doesn't talk about the product, that it's purple, but that's it, really, and evokes the feeling of the product. And that is enough to cut through to an extent that the world went mad and the world bought chocolate. And I also think it's very interesting that this demonstrates that an ad that has an enormous PR power and talkability can go on to have commercial success. And actually, that's probably what you need as much of in this modern era as anything. You need ads that have talkability and communications that have talkability because that really does... It's not just people go, oh, that's a nice ad, and then move on. If they talk about it, they're more likely to act upon it, and this paper shows that a lot. I think Cadbury's Dairy Milk is a brilliant example of a campaign that's moved from an advertising-led campaign where it's structured around a common creative idea into something that's structured around a higher-order brand idea and a brand value, so it definitely moved into the brand-led uh, orchestration model. What we observed with IPA Data Mind 3 was that the way that campaigns were being uh, created, constructed and delivered was more like conducting an orchestra these days than ever it has been before. The genius in the media strategy in this campaign is threefold. Firstly, there's allowing the creative work to have the space to running long format ads and giving it fewer spots in impactful programmes. The second level was totally understanding how modern technology facilitates sharing and the great pleasure that can give consumers to send something funny to their friends, something interesting. The third level is for those smaller group of people who actually interacted with it and laid down their own music and their own cuts and then shared that with their friends. That really drives consumer engagement. And if you can drive that with your brand, I think you're really achieving something special using traditional media merged with new media to gather consumer power behind the brand was fantastic. So Cadbury in the UK uh, between 2007 and 2009 had record years, so their, their sales and profit growth uh, was unparalleled. For Glass and a Half Full Productions, every pound spent on advertising pays back £4.19 in revenue, which is markedly higher than the old persuasion model was delivering. And Cadbury Dairy Milk, at the end of 2010, for the first time broke through the £400 million barrier. Because Cadbury Dairy Milk is the engine of the whole Cadbury business, fame for Cadbury Dairy Milk transfers to fame for the other brands. And what we saw was a halo effect of CDM advertising on the sales of other brands in the portfolio. So for me personally, Guerrilla was, and the campaign was probably the hardest thing that, that I've ever had to do in my career, but also the most rewarding to have put so much passion and energy into it and then to see those, those results. So it's something I will always remember and look back on. And uh, the thing I always say to people is for all that hard work and tenacity, what I get is every time my name appears in the press, I get a picture of a gorilla next to it, but <laughs> could be worse. So I think there's a, there's a sales success which is well documented, but I think actually the, the legacy piece is that when a marketing department and a business enjoys 
the kind of surge of popularity and respect that accompanies a piece like that. It can actually genuinely infuse uh, a business. That's the lasting impression internally of, of that work, is that people walk a little bit taller, um, take a few more risks, brief in that slightly more spirited um, sense of possibility. I think this campaign has had a bigger effect on Cadbury as an organisation and as a business than any of us ever expected or hoped for when we started work on this campaign. It's had some really incredible business results. It has turned declining sales into growth. It's demonstrably hardened price elasticity and it's had a really positive measurable effect on other brands in the Cadbury portfolio so the business effect has been really strong but I think there's also been a softer more emotional effect which is really profound in terms of the organisation and the belief in this brand and the ambitions for this brand going forward we just have even bigger ambitions and bigger dreams for Cadbury Dairy Milk than we did when we first started.